Over the last few weeks, I'm going to assume that you've probably seen more scientists on your television screen than you've probably seen maybe ever. And that's hardly surprising given the new coronavirus pandemic that's engulfing the world. But as an epidemiologist myself, I wanted to take the opportunity to just explain a little bit about the science and offer you some strategies for managing the stress related to the uncertainty around this pandemic. As always, for the very best in health and wellness advice, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll know whenever I post a new video. Hi, I'm Leah and welcome to The Thrive Practice. This channel is dedicated to providing you with evidence-based wellness advice that empowers and inspires you to hack your way to better health. So let's start with the epidemiological science around bringing this virus under control. I'm not gonna go through the science of this epidemic because I'm pretty sure by now having watched the news and seen various videos on YouTube and other places around the internet that you're probably very aware of how this virus potentially started and the timeline of events that have led us to this point. So today is Wednesday the 18th of March and on Monday of this week, Imperial College researchers published a paper outlining the projection of the epidemic in the UK and the US, given the application of various interventions. So let's take the do nothing uncontrolled epidemic scenario. In this situation, the epidemiological model suggests that there would be about 510,000 deaths in Great Britain and 2.2 million deaths in the US, with a higher peak of deaths in Great Britain due to the older population compared to the US. The paper suggests two fundamental strategies for bringing the virus under control within these population, suppression and mitigation. With suppression, the aim is to reduce the basic reproductive number below one. And with mitigation, the aim is to reduce the basic reproductive number, but not below one. The basic reproductive number is an epidemiological term used to measure the transmission potential of a particular infection. It is the average number of secondary cases a single case will generate. And in the case of COVID-19, the R0, or the basic reproductive number, lies somewhere between around 1.5 and 3.5. So what are the differences between these two strategies? Well, let's take suppression to begin with. Suppression was used in China and South Korea quite successfully to reduce the number of cases. However, given what we know about the transmission of this new coronavirus, this approach would have to be sustained for a long period of time to avoid a resurgence once the controls were lifted and obviously is associated with considerable social and economic costs. In the case of mitigation, the aim is to reduce the basic reproductive number, but not to below one, as in suppression. This would reduce the impact of an epidemic by flattening the epidemic curve, and the population will build up immunity through the epidemic, eventually leading to a rapid decline in cases and a reduction in transmission. However, it would be necessary for social distancing measures to be in place for as much of the epidemic as possible, and it's important that the interventions aren't introduced too early before sufficient herd immunity has developed within the population. Another thing to consider is that this strategy will not fully protect those at high risk from severe disease or death and is unlikely to be feasible without emergency healthcare surge capacity in the US and UK being exceeded many times over. To achieve mitigation or suppression, the researchers looked at four specific types of interventions. These were case isolation, social distancing of the entire population, and either household quarantine or school and universities closures. The researchers go on to say that all four interventions combined, which goes a little way short of being a complete lockdown, will have the largest predicted effect on transmission. This combination intervention will reduce critical care requirements from a peak approximately three weeks after the intervention and decline as long as these interventions remain in place. However, once interventions were relaxed in the autumn, the modelling suggests that there will be a rise in infections leading to a second peak later on in the year. Now, in order for us to avoid this rebound transmission, we would need to ensure that the interventions remained in place until there were large enough supplies of vaccines available to support the population. And that could take anywhere between 12 and 18 months. The researchers concluded that epidemic suppression is the only viable strategy at this time. Epidemic suppression requires an awful big ask of the public to monitor themselves, to ensure that they are socially responsible 
and realistically no public health intervention really works without the people backing it themselves. So comment below and tell me how you think either the mitigation or the viral suppression strategy will work with your in your country. So let's move on to looking at how we can manage some of the anxiety and stress around this COVID-19 pandemic. Stress in modern life is ubiquitous and the added stress of this pandemic with the uncertainty attached to it and the lack of control that you may feel um, and the worry that you have for your family, yourself, um, people that you love and care for, all of which pulls you away from the thing that really matters and that's about keeping yourself and your family as healthy and well as possible. Stress can have a really profound effect on the body, um, both physically and psychologically. On the physical plane, we're looking at an increased heart rate, possibly higher blood pressure, and maybe even digestive difficulties. Psychological stress can also increase inflammation. As your brain triggers the release of stress hormones throughout the body, that sends signals to the nervous system, ensuring that the body reallocates the energy resources that it has to fight in the imminent danger, which may not be there. In the short term, this stress has benefits, but over a long period of time, and let's face it, this COVID-19 infection may last a good long while, this can be really damaging for the body and actually reduces the immune system's ability to fight off infections. So what can you do? Avoid information overload. There is a point at which for most people, having too much information coming in, too much negative information particularly, can increase the likelihood of stress and anxiety within them. You need to know what that is for you. And if you are reaching the point where you are completely saturated with all the information that's coming in about COVID-19 and the government's response to it and what you should and shouldn't be doing, you need to take a step back from it. Remember, this is a new virus. No one has all the answers. We're in fact learning all the time, every single day. It is best to know that that is the case. We therefore need to take a responsibility for our own sphere of influence and not worry about the things that we absolutely cannot control. All you can do is ensure that you and your family, and the people in your household, the people you care for, are have all the information in terms of making sure that they reduce their risk of infection. So that's the hand hygiene stuff that I mentioned in my last video. So in order to not become stressed and overwhelmed with all of this pandemic information, it might be best to limit the amount of time that you spend watching the news or reading about um, COVID-19, um, watching the cases. Maybe watch the press briefings or the press conference with the government. And after that, don't just turn it off and focus on something different. Um, just get the, the pure facts without all of the 24 hour news cycle. Remember, you have a choice in how you receive the information that's out there. You can dwell on it or you can say this is the cards that you've been dealt with. This is how life is at the moment. I'm going to make the very best of this situation because every cloud has a silver lining. From a broad evidence base, the New Economics Foundation reduced a long list of actions to support mental well-being to five key messages. These were connect, be active, keep learning, take notice and give. And the Children's Society have for children replaced give with be creative and play. These actions are designed to produce their own positive feedback loop, reinforcing frequent and similar positive actions to support well-being. Other tips include practicing gratitude, being grateful for the time that you now get to spend with your family and loved ones that you probably would have not been able to spend um, because you'd been at work or the kids would have been at school or you know whatever. Think about how much money you've managed to save by not having to be on public transport and being able to work from home. If you've ever wanted to start a new project, now's the time to do it. Think about all the things that you could learn, all the things that you can try your hand at doing. This is a great opportunity for you to try something new. Maybe try meditating. Meditation has enormous positive mental health benefits. Um, and now again, you have a little more time on your hands. Potentially, this might be a really good opportunity for you to take more care of your health and well-being while you have the opportunity to. So there you have it, the science behind controlling this virus and some strategies to help you as we go through the control phase of this epidemic.
As always, if you're ready to hack your way to better health, consider subscribing to this channel and hitting the bell notification so you're aware whenever I post a new video. Thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.